So this chapter, chapter 12, uh, Money and Banking in the Developing Economy, culminates our discussion of how the United States as a developing, understood as a developing country, how it, how it gets all the pieces together, right? In the previous um, chapter, we talked about the infrastructure investments uh, in canals, in roads, in railroads. Um, previous to that, we talked about labor and we talked about specialization of labor. Um, and here we talk about how Really, oftentimes, from an economist's perspective, what separates a developing economy from a developed economy is the availability of credit. Um, and the United States, even from when it began, did have a problem um, establishing credit. That was part of the debate between Alexander Hamilton and... Um, uh, John Adams and um, Thomas Jefferson uh, among our founding fathers. Now, I've never seen the the musical, the Hamilton musical. I know nothing about the musical. Um, I haven't even watched the TV version thing. I have no interest in that kind of thing. Uh, right? I mean, everyone's different, right? And I really, you know, it, it's... I don't think anything different of someone who has seen it nor has not seen it. Um, I just don't take any... Um, this is not what I enjoy. Um, on, you know, on top of that, I've never really... I haven't seen a great deal of Disney movies, despite the fact that I have three children. Um, I have incredibly distant notions of Disney movies and I don't even remember them very long um oh there was that one the one with the cat um it's that Disney movie with a cat and the dad dies um <clears throat> uh Lion King Lion King um yeah, I mean, you, despite what people say, you can have kids and not have watched many Disney movies. It's on in the background and it appears, but um, you don't have to be an expert at the movies to, to have children. Um, it probably helps. It gives you something additionally to talk about, but you'll survive. Okay, uh, <laughs> to the important topic, which is money and banking. So I'm going to keep doing this so that we have some ideas of images while I talk so it's not just so cut and dry but this building here um, I've seen it I've toured it um, I lived only about three miles away from it when I lived in uh, Philadelphia um, this here is the first bank of the US um, it was established largely out of a compromise um, between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. Um, Thomas Jefferson wanted the Washing what would become Washington, D.C. to be located um, near Virginia, um, which was his home colony, home state. Um, he kind of wanted it in the South. And Alexander Hamilton didn't really care. He wanted a national bank. Um, and so in the compromise, they exchanged that for each other. Um, again, I have not seen Hamilton the musical, but if it's anything what I think it should do, um, everyone focuses on the fact that um, he died in a duel, which is, you know, cool. Um, you know, it gives you an interesting backstory. Um, at the same time, as an economist, the value of him and how the United States was able to become a developed economy focused entirely, was oriented entirely around um, him um, establishing this monetary system. And it involves really three things. One, it involves a building like this, a national bank, 
Two, it involves having a currency. Three, it involves having uh, credit abroad. So you need those three things to be able to carry everything else out. Okay, so um, let's start with um, the U.S. dollar, which is kind of our um, starting point here. Um, the dollar that we have largely comes, again, from uh, Spain. Um, it was the, as the textbook even points out, was a, um, a common name that was given to... Um, was a common name that was given to um, the Spanish peso was the dollar. The dollar was split into um, uh, twelfths. Um, it's a little bit problematic. Um, well, the math is a little bit more difficult. So fortunately, they did convert to the um, the metric system. Um, the decimal system is in essence um, where the dollar was divided into fifths and tenths and um, by a factor of five, basically. Um, the United States, as it was coming into being, um, had to be concerned about what was the, the currency going to be backed by. Because at the time late 1700s um, really what everything is relying on at this point is what's called a commodity currency and it's in a commodity currency where it's backed by something that has an intrinsic value and the two major commodities out there at the time were silver and gold some countries used silver, some used gold. And so the first big choice with having a, um, a currency was what was it going to be backed by? The reason why you want to back it up with something by having it be a commodity money is because the alternative is that the money is what's called a fiat money. In a fiat money, F-I-A-T, under a fiat money, the money's just printed, right? It's just printed. It's not backed by anything. It's what we have in the United States today. Um, if you're taking my Econ 340 class right now, um, I discussed a bit about how um, the money supply grew dramatically during the COVID-19 pandemic. Because we don't have a commodity money, you can just print it. You don't have to have any authority. Um, you don't have to have any gold. Um, you can just say, we want to print more cash to avoid an economic crisis, which is exactly what happened. The reason why the founders of the country didn't want to do that is because typically, um, almost inevitably, what happens is that if a government is empowered to print its own currency, it almost always does print too much. The United States has done it. Every country in the world has done it and will probably continue to do it. Um, which is why, generally speaking, um, inflation is the problem that economists are most concerned about. And it's what our founders, it's what the founders of our country were most worried about was um was inflation. And so the only way you can really avoid inflation, um, for the most part, is by backing it up with a commodity. And in the United States, at the founding of the country, they basically picked both, both gold and silver. They used gold for larger transactions and silver for everyday transactions. Um, <coughs> now, the goal in the beginning was that we would um, have a general currency, a currency that was used across the country. Um, unfortunately, um, 
it became um, impossible um, to do that in the beginning. Um, one of the problems, for instance, that we had between having a gold st standard backed currency and a silver standard backed um, currency or coin was that um, the two values had to be linked to each other. That the value of gold to silver, that those two coins had to have the same relative value. Otherwise, everyone's just going to crowd to um, where the money, uh, where the greater value is, whether it be gold or silver. Um, as I just said, for the most part, under a commodity currency, you don't really have to worry about inflation. But one of the reasons why there's no country today in the world that uses a gold standard or silver standard, despite the fact that it's the best cure for inflation, is that largely for the most part, um, economists are largely Keynesian, even if they're not, even if they say they're not. By that I mean economists do generally believe today that you can manage an economy out of a recession or keep a good economic expansion period going for longer. And that the only way you can do that is with fiscal policy and monetary policy. Monetary policy being expanding or contracting the money supply. And unfortunately, with a gold standard or silver standard, unless you discover gold or silver, or a boat laden with gold or silver sinks, that's the only kind of monetary policy you get. And in fact, these examples I just gave you is what causes a great deal of economic turmoil in the 1800s. That economic crises were caused by the sinking of ships that contained gold, and that you had inflation after discoveries of gold in California and in Alaska. Now, even though there was a, um, a coinage act, a coin act for, for the minting of coins, um, you had the other challenge or the other redeeming feature that there were, um, there was paper currency as well. And while the national government focused on minting coins, um, the states did a great deal of the printing of money. The states themselves didn't do it, but rather the states helped establish banks. And those banks, in turn, um, printed currencies. And that really causes some turmoil in the early 1800s. As I said in the book, um, before 1790, you only have three banks that are basically printing currency. By 1811, you have 88. And they're all making um, their own paper currencies. So what they're doing, like what gives them the ability to issue these currencies, is that the banks are taking in deposits, and then it's basically giving them um, it's accepting their deposits, which are probably in gold or silver or coins, and then it's issuing uh, paper currency, which is easier to hold. And it's circulating like cash or like a check, basically. And then you can use that to buy the other things. Um, the problem is that as you travel in the country, they might not know the bank that you have your account with. Or because there are so many currencies out there, there's no way for them to know that that currency is not a counterfeit. So let's look at some examples here. So here we have um, a coin from the uh, colony era. Uh, this was designed actually by Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin both liked 
sundials, and so you see um, a sundial here. Um, but he also included this line, mind your business. Now, it doesn't mean, like, you know, don't meddle in others' affairs. Like, don't, like, don't be nosy. It's not meaning that. Rather, Ben Franklin was known to be a pretty good entrepreneur, a pretty good business person. And so this was kind of just saying, you know, do good business work, right? Do, like, stay engaged in your business. Don't let it... Um, don't um, fail to, to watch your business. Now, when we look at this coin, you'd think, oh, shit, that's like the first some of the first coins in the United States. Well, it's actually recently become discovered that this probably wasn't an actual um, officially circulated coin. That this probably was something more commemorative. But it does give you an idea of um, what these coins um, look like. And the value of the currency minted would have been whatever the silver content was in this coin. Then you've got the paper currency. I mean, dude, you look at this and you're like, this is pretty easy to counterfeit. You still have your same line, mind your business. You still have your sundial. Philadelphia is really the center of the colonies at this point. Um, and so this is predating the, the birth of the country. And this is a third of a dollar. And yeah, it's a pretty junky looking piece of currency, but it is a currency nonetheless. But then here's really what I'm talking about is existing after the country comes into existence and you're in the early 1800s, you've got banks basically making their own currencies. Here you've got Rhode Island, Rhode Island Exchange Bank making its own $1 bill. Now, Rhode Island was known for um, uh, basically clothes making, right? Like turning cotton into clothing. And so you see this kind of industry promoted on the currency. And, um, right, th you can get an idea, though, of the problem, right? Is what if I'm from Pennsylvania? And I'm like, fuck if I know of Rhode Island Exchange Bank. How do I know this isn't a fake and yet you didn't just copy it? Um, I don't know this bank. I'm certainly going to take a risk by accepting it from you. So I'm not going to give you a dollar for this dollar. I'll give you 80 cents, 75 cents, right? Depending on how much or how little I trust it. Because I'm taking a risk as a merchant accepting your Rhode Island Exchange Bank currency. And then compare that to this. This is coming out of Pennsylvania where oil is basically first discovered. So now we've got Petroleum Bank with an oil well reflecting most of these um, currencies issued by these banks are going to feature the prominent industry in that area. So here we've got the uh, petroleum bank. And then you start to get, and, and we'll come to this, you start to get um, bonds that are going to be issued. And we're going to talk about this person here, Jay Cook, because he actually becomes very important later in this story. This itself is not a um, is not a is not currency, but rather it's a, an example of an early bond in the United States. So this would be the issuance of debt by the U.S. government. <coughs> Here's a um, another example: the Alton National Bank. Um, I believe this is from Illinois, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think this is Alton, Illinois. 
So this gives you another example, a little bit. Now this would be essentially the frontier. Um, I believe this is Alton, yeah, Illinois. Actually, yeah, it says right here, Alton, Illinois. Now, as you move further out west, you don't have as much uh, industry going on. So here you kind of are just kind of playing up these ideas of liberty and um, things like that. But now, here's something that emerges that's a bit different. Look at this, national currency, as opposed to this, which does not contain that line. Also, compare the fact that this has the seal of the U.S. Treasury, which we see in some variation on our currencies today, as opposed to this, which does not. A shift happened. A shift between this, the petroleum bank, again, I'm just going to guess here, um, probably 1840s would be my best guess. And this is going to be, yeah, 1865. Something happens. Something happens in the United States that takes us from state-based bank centric currencies to a national currency at the time of the Civil War. And that's going to become an important part of the story of this chapter as well. So one of the problems with having currencies that look like this is, again, as I said, it doesn't help to have lots of different currencies out there because you don't know how much you can trust the individual banks. You don't know how much you can trust the individual currencies. Um, people saving money, it's now kind of linked to this bank because now only that bank is issuing its own currency for that individual to draw down as credit. So the market, a unified banking market in the United States doesn't exist. And commerce is hurt to the extent that I, as a person, am not getting my dollar for a dollar as I travel. Now you get the development of um, books, basically, um, to try to to find out what is a counterfeit. Um, what are you know? What's the the latest knowledge about what is a counterfeit out there or not? But um, the idea was that there was a realization that we needed a national currency. But there was also the realization that we needed a national bank. See, because when the country started, we had this. We had this national bank. And the national bank did a lot of what you would think a national bank would do. It uh, basically cast checks for the federal government. It issued... Um, checks for the federal government and it lent money to the federal government. Um, it would have been a place that if you were a large industry in the United States and you needed money, you probably would know you could go to this bank and in turn this bank could look to the leading industries and say, how is the economy doing um, you know, is there anything we can do to help your industry thrive? Because that would obviously help the United States as a country thrive. Um, again, Hamilton gets this basically as a trade-off. He gets it as a trade-off from Thomas Jefferson for placing Washington, D.C. Um, near Virginia. Not too many fans of what was considered Hamilton's radical idea of having a national bank. I mean, dude, they had just, like, thrown off England. And everyone knows that money can corrupt. So people weren't exactly looking forward to, you know, getting rid of England and, like, fighting and dying, you know, to get rid of England, only to have the U.S. bank emerge um, and control their lives that way. So... Um, you know, probably reluctantly, they establish 
the first bank of the United States, National Bank of the U.S., but they say this is just a test run. We're only going to do this, um, I believe the initial charter was for 20 years. So they basically say we'll do it, we'll test it out, we'll see what it's like. Um, we don't have a lot of examples of what that those currencies look like. The book has an example, um, page 207. The book has an example of what that kind of currency looked like. Um, you know, it's not, um, didn't look that fancy. Um, but really one of the biggest roles that it served um, to start the banking system off is that it served as a lender of last resort, meaning it was the place you could turn to to get the economy out of a crisis caused by no money being willing to be borrowed, lent out, borrowed out. And in the beginning, this institution, this U.S. bank, did well. It actually did stabilize the economy well. And by issuing a standardized currency in the very beginning, um, you didn't have this multitude of currencies from all the individual states like these. You had a single national currency. By having a single currency, you can control how much is printed, um, you can ensure that it contains that it maintains that value. You can help establish the U.S. dollar as the money of the United States. But it's in controlling things as they did that obviously causes some of the problems for the bank. Because then everyone starts to get worried about this bank becoming all too powerful and the effect that that monopoly is going to have. Um, there was some questionable authority of this bank for this bank um, about whether the central bank should exist. And I should say, there are some people to this day that believe that the Federal Reserve, the national bank that exists today, um, shouldn't exist because it's not part of the U.S. Constitution. Um, it's actually a federal law that establishes it in 1913. So there's people out there. It shouldn't be too hard to Google it if you're that interested in the idea. But if you Google Federal Reserve is illegal, I'm sure you... Well, why should we... Um, let's just see. Yeah, see? So you could read this. Um, this is Secret Temple. Um... Right, it doesn't take a lot to read. Obviously, the internet, what makes it beautiful and what makes it um, not beautiful would be the fact that anyone can print anything they want on the web. And I'm not, I'm, I'm telling you that it's a good thing we have a central bank. It's a good thing we have a Federal Reserve. I can't say to you it's 100% constitutional, but. You know, it's not in the Constitution to be nice to each other either, but it's a good thing to do. And in this case, it's actually a good thing to have a central bank because we get some stability from it. Now, if only Alexander Hamilton could have explained it as well as me. Um, so, you know, the, um, the first bank of the U.S., um, at some point, that um, initial 20-year time period, it runs out. Um, and um, it, it, although it's divisive, um, they do decide on, the, on a very narrow vote, um, they do decide to um, renew the charter and basically establish the second bank of the U.S., but the problem is that the success enjoyed by the first bank of the U.S. in establishing the currency and ensuring that we didn't have incredibly high inflation, unfortunately, just as that was happening, um, the, the second bank of the U.S. was being created, uh, we had to fight Britain in the War of 1812. 
And, dude, we didn't have the money to finance a war just after having fought a war. Um, so a lot of money was printed, and so we had um, inflation. And it didn't help. Um, it didn't help that with the Second Bank of the U.S., um, it didn't help that it was seen as an institution that separated the East Coast from the frontier or the business person versus the common everyday working person. Because now you set up a situation where the second bank of the U.S. essentially isn't doing anything different than the first bank of the U.S. But because a rich aristocrat was running the second bank of the U.S., um, Nicholas Biddle, um, you know, it's not too difficult then for someone who touts himself as a president of the people, Andrew Jackson, um, to say, dude, we don't need this big bad bank. Let's just get rid of them. Um, we don't need them controlling our lives. Um, you know, Washington thinks it, or I guess in this case, Philadelphia thinks it knows best. But we know better than them. We don't need their stinking bank. Um, and that's what dooms the second bank of the U.S. And as the second bank of the U.S. Um, fails um, largely with the re-election, um, or sorry, um, the election, um, not re-election, but the election of um, Andrew Jackson, um, Andrew Jackson basically made it his point um, to get rid of the second bank. He had been burned by banks before, kind of as the book points out, and probably deep psychological scars like that are, are hard to get rid of. I mean, we all probably have a, an industry in this world that we really dislike because we got burned once before by them, and it's as old as time. Um, yeah, who screwed me over? Um, I don't know. I'm always wary of cell phone companies just because I remember as a teenager getting a cell phone and then obviously you get that bill and you're like, dude, that's not what I thought I was going to have to pay. And then they like, you know, really make the bill incredibly high and you weren't expecting it and you have no option except to pay it. And then it scars you for the rest of your life so that you dislike cell phone companies, um, which to this day is why I use prepaid and I don't even have a contract because it just... it scarred me it just like probably a national bank scarred andrew jackson um unfortunately andrew jackson's decision to dissolve the second bank of the u.s um did cause problems um it wasn't just a urban west um, you know, urban east versus western frontier debate. Also, the fact that the second bank of the U.S., like the first bank of the U.S., was located in Philadelphia. Uh, bankers that were increasingly being centered around New York City were grumpy as well about Philadelphia becoming a center of, of economic activity. So it was almost kind of like a perfect storm. And the bank essentially fails. And when that bank fails you have inflation. The economic system is just crazy. Um, you've got the currencies being issued by the states. You've got no one controlling um, how much is being printed. Um, you do have a recession after the failure um, after the dissolution of the second bank. Um, but probably what caused a bit more of the problems as well is that the banks were no longer being regulated. The state banks were no longer being regulated by the national bank. Um, so you had all these just kind of crazy banks coming into existence. Now, the book talks a bit about the debate that we've kind of economic historians have recently talked a bit more about, which would be 
was the inflation in the 1830s caused by the fact that the second bank of the U.S. was dissolved? And that really, the part of the problem was that silver was discovered, um, more silver was discovered. And so because it was discovered, that basically meant that the money supply increased dramatically. And so that probably caused more of the inflation than the dissolution of the bank. But certainly there was a um, recession, economic recession, that I think was caused by the dissolution of the second bank because of the fact that banks just engaged in crazier lending practices. And so then you see in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, these, it's almost kind of this reversion, this um, step back for the U.S. economy. Because now we lost our central bank. We have a more, we have a fluctuating economy. We've got individual state banks issuing all these crazy kind of currencies. And so that's a problem. You don't have a single unified banking system and monetary system um, in the United States. Now you get some attempts to, to try to fix that. And the book talks a bit about how, for instance, banks in um, New York, banks in Massachusetts tried to like um, create an exchange where basically all these different banks in New England could, um, in Massachusetts or in New York, could trust themselves and kind of create a, um, a regional currency. I mean, that at least demonstrates the value of not having multiple currencies out there. But also you see, too, this idea that um, we do need more regulations. And by getting more regulations, um, by getting more regulations, um, we can ensure that banks don't just fail. And so you see things like the, the forestall system, where banks basically agree to put up some of their um, currencies to avoid um, banks from just outright failing. Now, um, sorry, I'm just grabbing this here. Um, what we see, though, again, is that, you know, at this point, we're going to have the, um, this kind of ends the material, at least for this chapter, and ends the material um, prior to the exam. But what you're going to see in the next part of this course, where we deal with the Civil War and Reconstruction, is that something changed. Um, something changed in the money and banking system during the Civil War that helped the North win and doomed the Confederacy. And what you're seeing on this slide here is but one example of why the North succeeded. This was a bond, a thousand dollar bond issued by the U.S. federal government, sold by this individual named Jay Cook. That's an important name in financial history um, because he becomes basically the first investment banker um, in the United States based out of Philadelphia. And basically he hires a bunch of agents to basically go door to door and sell these bonds. Now, um, people had been buying other things in this subscription kind of way, like um, life insurance and whatnot. So buying bonds door to door was just an extension of that. Um, but by issuing bonds to finance the war, the North was able to largely avoid inflation. Whereas in the South, the Confederacy, there was no Jay Cook equivalent. In the South, as we'll see, had trouble issuing bonds. So then the only way they could finance their operations was by issuing currency, printing more and more currency. And so 
the Secretary of the Treasury, as we get towards the 1860s, um, Salmon Chase. Salmon Chase, um, he basically creates a national bank again. And that national bank issues national currencies like this that individuals can now trust. And so what Alton National Bank would do is it was forced to buy U.S. government debt that would back this dollar. And by saying national currency on the bottom, everyone knew it was good and that it could be exchanged at any national bank on a one-to-one -one basis. So even though it's printed by Alton National Bank as a national currency in the 1860s, it becomes exchangeable on a one-to-one -one basis with any other national currency. As opposed here to the, to the Confederacy. So this is a Confederate bond. These are called coupon bonds um, because even as you saw here with this, you saw these little coupons here, like things you would rip off. You basically turn these in to get your interest payment. So you'd rip one of these off to get your interest payment. This is what the Confederate currency looked like. And this was basically what was issued to um, finance the Confederate side of the battle. It was just printing currency like this. Not backed by anything, just printing it. It turns out to have been counterfeited quite a bit by Northerners. So in some sense it was like sabotage. The North was engaging in economic sabotage of the South by counterfeiting it, uh, the Southern currency. Um, the South actually issued one bond that was successful. It's called an Erlinger bond. It was developed by the French. Um, and the reason why it was successful was that it was actually a commodity-backed bond. You could actually exchange it for cotton, which is why you have this image on the bond of, I guess this wouldn't be Lady Liberty, I don't know what that would be, whatever the Confederate equivalent is, right? Carrying a um, Confederate States of America kind of flag, States of America flag, and some bales of cotton. And the value of this, it was exchanged in the Paris Exchange and in the London Exchange. So there were two um, bond, two places where you could buy these bonds. Or three, sorry, Amsterdam as well. Paris, London, and Amsterdam. Um, Amsterdam, again, being the world's headquarters for money and banking. Um, the value of this bond was the fact that you could exchange it for cotton. Whereas this bond, nothing was backing it. It was just a bond. Most of, uh, uh, almost all of which um, were not honored when the South um, lost um, the Civil War. And so you see another bond um, offering like this. And so these were issued by individual states um, within the um, Confederacy. And here's another example of a um, Confederate currency. Sorry for all these examples of Confederate currencies. It's just that there were so many different kinds um, being issued out there um, just because um, you had to, again, finance the war without issuing bonds. But because of the way that the Confederacy financed things by just printing money, prices exploded from a um, price ratio of 100 prices by the end of the war 
um, were 400 times what they were at the beginning of the war. Whereas in the north, prices only increased by 75%. So you still had 75% inflation, which isn't good. But obviously going from a price level basis of 100 to almost 4,000 um, is a 400% um, percent increase. I'm sorry, not 400% increase. Uh, 400 times um, value. And again, it's largely from the printing of more, um, more money. And you can see this here. This is the Confederacy, and this would be the issuance of um, the money supply here. And you can see it growing throughout the war. And again, this would be for the North. You can see that the North is largely using bonds to finance the war, not by printing notes. I mean, it is, but certainly nowhere as bad as the South, which is just printing lots of cash to be able to finance the war. Okay, that sets us up for the next part of this course, where we'll basically pick up things like this um, as we talk about um, uh, the Civil War and the development of the economy afterwards.